Thank you. Good, uh, good evening again and welcome to uh, Saturday night service. Um, whether you're uh, here present at the moment, as uh, many of you are, or whether you're joining us from, um, from home or listening to us, in fact, uh, later on. So I want to start by uh, bowing our heads in prayer again. Father, we come before your throne again to thank you for this evening and for this time that we're sharing. To thank you, Father, for the fact that we can study your word freely, Lord, gather freely. We may have taken that for granted in the past, Lord, but we are so thankful now that we can do it again. And Lord, we pray, Father, that this time that we spent together studying your word, Lord, that you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to understand what your will is for us in our lives. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like you to join me um, this evening as we read through um, our passage, which is from uh, the second epistle to the Corinthians, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 14, and in fact I'll read through to the first verse of chapter 7. So Second Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, verses 14 through to chapter 7, verse 1. And it's a passage that Phil touched on a few weeks ago and just want to share some additional thoughts um, again together this evening. So I read from verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We live in a time, um, in, a, in a remarkable time in human history, like no other. In a time where we are connected to every corner of the world. Uh, with our smart phones, our social media apps, our internet, we are always constantly connected with whoever we wish to be. I was amazed how with this really you know, tragic situation that's happening in the Ukraine at the moment, where my daughters were coming down and on this app called TikTok, which all of you know, um, which I thought was just a, a platform where you share funny videos and dances and stuff, but they were showing me live streamed footage of the war in the Ukraine even before the mainstream media had hold of that footage. Um, I, in fact, I was thinking as well when, you know, many times in the past, you know, and some of us are starting to travel again as the borders have opened up, you know, when I was traveling, I could FaceTime my wife from the airport or where I was staying on the other side of the world, live video feed, say hello quickly, whereas I remember in the past, um, you know, my parents would write a letter to Greece which would take two or three weeks to get there or they would try to speak to their loved ones in Greece on a crackly phone line, which would cost them like $15 in 1981, which is like $150 today. So we certainly live in a time, in an age, where we are connected with everybody around the world. And being connected to those you love and to those you need is great, yeah, as I said before, for me to be able to travel, and a lot of you do this as well, and every evening or quickly call our families at home and, and say hello and even video FaceTime each other is a great thing. 
But there's another kind of connectedness that is not so good. And, and we hear these buzzwords today often, and, and I was you know, having some quick dinner before we came here this evening, and there's the, 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 the gay Mardi Gras on in Sydney. And a lot of uh, the media stories, you know, it was one of the leading items on, on the news, and it was talking about tolerance and inclusivity and openness. And these buzzwords of tolerance, acceptance, um, um, uh, in inclusive, and, and all these buzzwords that are travelling around at the moment are very in vogue, very much in favour. And the, the idea behind all these terms is, 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 is togetherness or being connected on a, on, a, on a very basic human level as one mankind. There is a concerted push uh, in the world today to bring everyone closer together under the same umbrella. You know, one world, one society, and we hear that, in fact, during, you know, this, as I said before, this terrible situation in the Ukraine, where all of Europe is saying we are one Europe, where we should be one as mankind, and, you know, we've left the past aggressions, that's so, you know, much of the past century, and why are we like this again? And there's this push for us to be under the one umbrella, one society, one world, even one church. This is the heartbeat of the world today. And sadly, and I'll explain why I say sadly, this is becoming the heartbeat of the church of the world today. And I would just want to remind ourselves and remind all of us this evening that God, that God did not call his people to be inclusive. As we've read, he calls his people to be exclusive. In fact, the total opposite. The fact is we are called to be vastly different and vastly separate from the world around us. And it is a message that is vastly different and polarizing to the world around us. This trait of separation that we asked here and Paul commands in, verse, uh, in verses 14 through to 18, this trait of separation was very much lacking in the church of Corinth. All of, the churches, of all of the churches mentioned in the New Testament, the church in Corinth was undoubtedly the most worldly. If the church in Philippi was known for its kindness and, um, and its compassion, the church in Ephesus was known for its commitment to the Lord, well, the church in Corinth was known for being carnal, for being very much so connected with the city around it and the practice around it. It was a worldly church dwelling in a wicked city. The city of Corinth was so vile that to be called a Corinthian was in fact to mean that you were a person of low moral standing. And sadly, the evil of that society in Corinth had penetrated and spread within the church and things had gotten so bad in Corinth that there was little distinction between them within the church and the world around them or outside the church. And Paul is letting them know that these things should not be that way. These verses tell us everything we need to know on how to remain separate in what is in an increasingly connected world. Well, the world and the church of the world are melding, bonding themselves together so that there is little distinction between them anymore, God still expects his church and his people to be different, to stand apart from the crowd, to not be connected. He expects us to stand apart from those around us, outside the, in the world. And these verses very eloquently explain to us how we can accomplish just that. Now, let's talk about our church. You know, there may be some who would like to see the Greek free church to become more modern. Well, these verses not only tell us how to be different, 
they also show us why we should remain different as well. While all the church world around us is changing to accommodate the world, to make itself more relevant, to make itself more acceptable, we have some very good reasons for staying in the old paths of righteousness and worship and practice. And this evening I want us to, to consider this thought of staying separated as we're asked to in such a connected world, in such a world which is trying so hard to draw us into it. From verses 14 to 16, Paul uses several verbs to make his argument. He says, fellowship, communion, accord, and then he talks in 15, what part as a believer, and then also talks about agreement. All of these speak of something held in common, of something shared. And his basic argument here is that Jesus and his followers have nothing in common with the world around them. He points this truth out by revealing three areas in our lives, in these passages, that need to be contrasting to the world around us. First, there is a contrast in our walk with the world around us. The word uh, righteousness that we read in verse 14, the word righteousness has the idea of, uh, and I've got the um, definition out, the idea of purity of life or of that which is pleasing to God. The idea here is that God's children are to be different from the world in the way they conduct their lives. The second thing is, is that there is to be a contrast or a difference, a point of difference in our wisdom. And we see in verse 14 where Paul goes to pains to, to argue that light and dark cannot have fellowship. Even the tiniest bit of light has the power to dispel the most oppressive darkness. And I've mentioned this before, and I remember many years ago, we went with our family to um, the Gold Coast, and we went into one of those, uh, um, what do you call them, escape rooms. These um, rooms where you go in and they shut the rooms, and there's all these sensor sensory feelings, things brushing against you, and you've got to, and they, it becomes very dark, and it was smoky, and then you go into this other room, and it is pitch black to the point, and I remember our children were a bit younger then, it got quite frightening, even for myself. You couldn't see where you were going. You know, you're in there with three other kids and you're thinking, you know, what's happening here? Where are we going to, how are we going to get out? And I remember I had my phone on me. So I took my phone out and I just pushed the button to open up the home screen, not the, the, not the light. And just the faintest light that came out of it all of a sudden broke through the darkness. And it was such a different room after that. What Paul is talking about here is this, that a life governed by the word of God has no shared ground, nothing in common, no connectedness with a life governed by the flesh, by the world, and ultimately by the devil. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, we read, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 21, we read to 23. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. How can 
the Father and Jesus, how can they come and make a home in me when I've made room in my heart for the world? How can they come and rule in my heart and cleanse me from within when I've set aside part of my heart to be in unison with the world? We are to be different because we are to live our lives according to the word of God. We have a different standard of living than does the world. And it is vastly apart. And finally, there has to be a contrast in our worship. Paul reminds us that we are God's possession, just as there is no common ground between Jesus and the devil. And between one who confesses Christ and one who denies him. The idols and the passions of the flesh and the world have no business with the temple of God. Let us be reminded this evening that this church is not, this building is not the temple of God. You who are saved and this body of believers is the church and you who are saved is the temple of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The things of the world do not belong in your life, nor do they have a place in your worship of the Lord. Just as our physical life is to be clean, so too is our spiritual life. And this actually, just to make one point here, speaks volumes of the modern church. Our duty is not to make the church, the house of God, and our worship here, and I've heard this phrase said before, seeker-friendly, attractive to the masses, um, you know, something that makes people feel very much at ease when they come in. Our duty is to consecrate ourselves to the will of God and to worship him in spirit and in truth. We have no business to change our music, um, our preaching, you know, just to attract the world to the house of God. I was watching um, something on, on, on TV, and in fact, it was from the um, ACL, um, the Australian Christian Lobby. And they were just talking about, they're having a sort of a, a roundtable discussion. And they were talking about the state of the church in the world today, and particularly in Australia. And the point was made, and I thought of this as I was, I was writing um, some of my notes. The point was made at this discussion that the church today is the most liberal it's ever been. And what do I mean by that? It's the most easygoing, you know, come in and it's, you know, there's coffee and there's... Um, Great singing, and there may be a quick, short message. Nothing too condemning, though. We want to, you know, we want we want to attract the youth, and we want to make sure that you know we attract and make everybody feel comfortable, and we're, we're inclusive of everybody. And the point was being made that the church membership is, in fact, the lowest it's ever been for the last hundred years. Church membership in this country is the lowest, even though its churches are the most inclusive, the most liberal, the most welcoming, and the most opening. And the point was made at that um, round table that they were discussing was that it's because the church serves no point of difference anymore. It's like any other club. You can go and you can feel great about what you're doing, listen to some great music, some really uplifting sermons, which you could probably hear in a um, a well-being or a self-help seminar as well. Have some great um, 
coffee and a and, and, and bit of a banter with people, and you can go your own way. There is no point of difference. We need to create an atmosphere in our church where the Spirit of God can work, can convict, can move to repentance and bless. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In verse 15, we read, And what accord has Christ with Belial? Belial is another name for Satan. And the word accord in verse 15 means harmony. Um, you know, we, heard, we hear of harmonizing when we, we hear of you know, instruments playing together or, or singers harmonizing. And in Greek, the, um, the word for harmony is symphono. You know, that's where we get our, um, our modern word of symphony from because the instruments in this massive orchestra are a symphony. They agree together. They play in harmony. Just as there is a disharmony when a piece of music is suddenly in a separate key, at the same time, there is distinct and clear disharmony between Jesus and everything of this world. The whole point here is this, that God's people are to be different from this world and from everything around them because, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because they possess a new nature. You know, you get a pig that rolls in the mud because it is a pig. You know, my dad's got a place in, uh, in, in a, a holiday house in a place called Bass, and his next-door neighbour for a long time had this, um, was given a, a, little, a little piglet as a gift, and they called this little pig Monty. Now, Monty didn't stay a piglet very long because Monty was eating all the scraps, not from just the neighbour's house, but from our house as well, to the point where Monty would have been probably the, the size of, you know, four of these chairs put together. And Monty had a great life because the back part of the paddock was full of a mire and mud and Monty would just happily sit in there and grunt with contentment. You take Monty and you put him in a clean place, he won't be that happy. You take a pig and you change its nature to that of a sheep, then it would shun the mud and head straight for the green grass. If you are saved today, then you, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, you have a new nature. It's not like the old nature, but it is different. It needs to be hungry for the Lord's will. In verse 14, it makes it clear that we are commanded to be segregated from the world. It's important to understand that, as we read in verse 14, it talks about being yoked with unbelievers. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And where does this come from? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, it talked about a lot of laws. And one of the things it talked about was it was prohibited to yoke an ox and an ass, which is a donkey, together to um, use them to actually plough. Firstly, the ox was clean and the ass was not. And also, they had different mindsets. They just wouldn't go together. It wouldn't work. They would pull apart probably the harness and the, and the bridle that was holding them together. They possessed two different natures. To yoke them together was to invite trouble. And the phrase is usually applied to marriage. And Philip spoke about this a few weeks ago, as I mentioned at the start. And it is clear it is wrong to marry outside your faith if you are saved. But there is more to it than that. It has the idea of not walking with the world. 
The believer needs to closely monitor all of his or her relationships because walking with the world often results in walking like the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 33, verses 3, sorry, we read, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Walking with the world will result in, more often than not, walking like the world. Verse 17, we read, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. For those who walk the separate life have God's promise that he will receive them. And the word receive here means to treat with favor. God is saying, if you will separate yourself from this world for my glory, as you are new creations, then you will enjoy my, my favour, my smile, my favour will be on you for your life. And it doesn't mean that you will have an easy life. And we've spoken about this many times before. But more importantly, when things get tough, when the going gets tough, when we go through life's challenges and troubles, as we always will go through, what I want, though, is God's favour on my life during those times. I want his smile upon my life. A clean, separated life is how you find favour with God in your life. And then when you have times of trouble and times of turmoil, you will still have the assurance of God's favour through those times. Often there is a rift between the Lord and his children because of what they have in their hearts and what they have in their lives. And many of us have yoked ourselves to the world in different ways and each of us can consider that for him or herself. And they hold us back as we are expected to go in a straight line as the ox needs to plow. These things that we have yoked ourselves with lead us to the left, to the right, make us less efficient for the Lord's work, draw us away, bring conflict and hurt. But when these things are taken care of and that child turns back to God in holiness and separation, that person will enjoy the sweet fellowship of the Lord once again, Paul tells us, finally in chapter 7, verse 1, that it is the promises and the person of God that should motivate each of us to seek a closer, more consecrated and separated from the world walk with the Lord. And we read, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We are called upon to cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Well, filthiness of the flesh could refer to those external acts of, of sin, of Wickedness of filthiness of the spirit, of wickedness and, and filthiness of the spirit could refer to those internal attitudes of the heart that lead to external sin. We could preach all night about the sins of the flesh. However, what you do and what I do on the outside is merely a symptom of what the problem is with the inside. Many people, maybe many of you, myself included, have confessed the same sins over and over again and still go right out and do the same things again. Why? Because the real problem 
is not with the body that does the actions. The real problem is with the heart. You see, the body, we may try to train our bodies not to look here or do this or that, but whilst the heart remains sinful and hiding sin and evil, the body is just an inanimate object that will carry out what comes on from within the heart and the will. What is within the heart will be carried out by the body. Therefore, what Paul is saying here to us is that we must actively cleanse ourselves both inwardly and outwardly so that the favour of God can rest upon us and upon our, us as a body of believers. You see, it's not enough for us to just ask God to fix us, to ask for cleansing. The word here, he says, is let us cleanse ourselves. It calls for you to be actively involved, for me to be actively involved in this process, to search the recesses of my heart, to bring those issues that we hold to us, our, our yokes to the world, to bring them to the Lord. And many times it's hard to pull those away from us, to pull aside from those from those, um, those joints that we've made, those unions that we've made, whatever they may be. It's very hard to do that. But we actively have to firstly ask the Lord for us to be able to see what those things are, but also we need to do our part and actively search ourselves and work to perfect what God has started with us, within us. So this phrase of perfecting holiness that Paul tells us has the idea of, and I've written down, completing or getting the whole mind of Christ into the soul. It is about us ceasing to be driven about by our flesh, by the world, by the devil, and it is about us beginning to be moved through life by a desire to please the Lord. In other words, this idea of perfecting holiness is the idea of Christ in you and living in you to enable you to live a life that honours and glorifies the Lord. And how is this possible? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, we read about that. We read about resisting and avoiding sin in all its forms. It's about setting the fear of God before our eyes. That is, by us refusing to engage in any thought or activity that would bring displeasure of God to us. Many times at work, you know, we are told, be careful what you write in an email. And before you write it, we're told, just read it first and see how would it sound on the front page of the Herald Sun or the Age. And that gives you a sort of a different perspective. And similarly, if you engage in a thought or activity, you need to think to yourself, how would that look if God was participating with you in that activity by your side? Would it bring displeasure or would it please God? And that is what I mean by saying the fear of God. Where is our fear of the Lord and his holiness in our day to day? Are we really expected to remain separate in this connected world? Yes, we are. But we are to be separated, but not isolated. Do you remember Jesus? He lived on this earth and in this world, and he lived a perfectly 
holy life. But at the same time, he was a friend of the tax collector and of the sinner. And like a skillful surgeon who goes in and actually treats the disease, but doesn't become part of the problem, we too are to practice contact with this world without contaminating ourselves. If we are to be part of this world, it is so that we can show God's glory and the difference that we have to those around us. We have to be here in this world. We have to interact with the world around us. We all have to work. We all have to interact with those who are non-believers. But we have to try to reach them. But even while we live here in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, we are to shine as lights in this world. Let us never be ashamed of the fact that the Greek free church is out of step with this world. Let us never be ashamed of what we are and of what we believe and of the convictions that we hold sacred. Many of those convictions many would call old-fashioned, maybe bigoted, maybe hate speech, whatever they call it. Instead, let us strive to ensure that it remains that way until Jesus returns. If we begin to lower the standard today, we will soon be no different to the myriads of churches all around who have forfeited and abandoned the presence and the power of God so they may gain some popularity, popularity and praise with the communities around them. Oswald Chambers writes in one of his devotionals, What you allow in moderation today, you will do in excess tomorrow. I'll repeat that. What you allow in moderation today, you will do in excess tomorrow. I pray that we all stay on the path of consecration and conviction for our Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory and that we strive to remain separated and not connected and integrated with the world around us. Let us pray. Father, it is before your throne of grace this evening that we come to thank you for the time that we've shared together. To thank you, Father, for your word, which is like a two-edged sword, Lord. And we know, Father, and we acknowledge that we live in perilous times, in times, Father, that we are called to be inclusive, to be connected, to be tolerant of everything and everyone, Lord. But, Father, your word is different. You tell us to be separated, Lord, to be consecrated, to be taken out of, to be unyoked to those around us, Lord. And Father, we are called to do that so that we can be a point of difference, so that your glory and your holiness may shine through us, Lord, that people can be convicted and can see a difference, Lord, through our lives, pointing to you, Father. And Lord, we pray this evening that you help us understand the areas in our lives, Father, that we need to take back to the cross, Lord, Convict us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, whatever was said, whatever was spoken about with human weakness, Lord, may your Holy Spirit, Father, correct and instill in our hearts in the way that you want us to hear it, Lord. We pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.